Hello, everybody. I am delighted to have you all here today. Thank you for joining us. Good morning to everyone who's joining us today in the fourth session of Decolonizing Aid, Planetary Solidarity Beyond Aid. This session, uh, we are speaking about speak, um, smashing windows, um, rethinking aid uh, beyond the north south um, axis, and we are very much looking forward. Ja, und jetzt die dritte Runde. Herzlich willkommen ähm, in deutscher Sprache zu unserer vierten Session. Okay, and now I'm going to switch to German. This is the fourth webinar in our series, Decolonizing uh, Aid. And the three of us, we are delighted to have you here today. Today's session is going to be about the question how the world can be seen from, can be reconstructed from the South-South perspective, particularly considering the issue of aid. My name is Uta Ruppert. I am a professor for political science at Frankfurt University. Global South, that means North-South and South-South relations, that's my focus and my work. I have been working in this field and teaching for more than two decades. And in that position, I have all kinds of cooperations with Medico. I'm not going to give you a technical introduction, and I would like to tell you how we would like this fishbowl uh, session to be, and then I'm going to switch to English. You have, might have already seen in the chat that everybody can select the language they want to listen to. You can do that by clicking on the little globe at the bottom, and then you can choose the language that you would like to listen to. We have simultaneous interpretation for German, English, and Bahasa Indonesian. We would like this session to be as interactive as possible. Of course, there are limitations because we know we're on the internet and we have videos, but we would like it to be a fishbowl discussion. That means that we would like to give everybody the opportunity to join the panel. We're going to listen to a presentation first, and afterwards we will have a lot of time for discussion. And if you would like to join the discussion, be that by asking a question or maybe you would like to comment or make a remark, please raise your hand. You can do that by clicking on the little hand at the bottom. And then the people working behind the scenes are going to ask you if you would like to turn on your camera for your contribution or if you would prefer to just speak without video and then they will they will then um, authorize uh, give you the right to speak and please also indicate the language that you will use to make sure that everybody can switch to the right channel and also i would like to remind all of us to please speak slowly throughout the session to make sure that everybody, including our interpreters, can follow all the presentations. And just like in every other webinar, you will have the opportunity to write any comments in the chat functions. We will collect them and include them in our discussion. Right. And now I would like to switch to English. And that will start again with the remark that, of course, I'm very happy to facilitate here today. Um, and this the more since um, today's 
event is the one on smashing windows. And I have to admit um, that I am especially interested in this approach theoretically as well as practically. Or to put it a bit more precisely, the whole series is trying um, to follow Audre Lorde's image of closing down finally the master's house, which in our case is um, the whole context of the modernist development discourse in all its theoretical and material dimensions. And in this context today, it is the question whether and how smashing windows is a kind of entry point to radically rethink aid beyond the north-south axis. And of course, it's a very special um, pleasure also to moderate here today um, because of our special guest and speaker of today, who is um, Professor Zabello Lovo Caceni. And within the decolonizing development context, um, he is without any doubt one of um, the most important window smashing theorists. And um, I am really, really honored to be with him here to share the screen with you, Savello. It's a special pleasure. But before giving him the floor, um, I want to take a very quick look back and um, try to recap how far we've come um, before we get down um, to the windows. The first round we had already three. This is our fourth round of discussion. The first round um, would be about architecture and imaginaries of development and aid and um, in how far it is in general possible to, to rethink aid. Our second meeting asked about the requirements and potentials of social ecological transformation and um, their intersections or contradictions to the architecture of aid. The third meeting four weeks ago revolved around um, the, all the questions of humanitarian aid and the special question of whether and to what extent humanitarian aid can contribute to the transformation, um, not just of development, but of capitalist world system as a whole. What was most striking to me in all discussions was that when we talked about development and development aid, even if our context of discussion is a very, uh, a very critical one and provided by Radha and Lian representing two critical organizations and even critical think tanks, Against this background, most of the time um, when talking about aid, we criticized official institutional government policies. However, when we ask more closely about the role and function of critical organizations, in my view, the picture became rather vague. This is why I feel from the previous discussions, we clearly have the open discussion, uh, the, the open question, um, to what extent can critical independent development organizations from the North make a substantial contribution to the discourse on, colonize, on decolonizing aid? Can they even do that? Do we have a real, um, position and role in this discussion? What can be the role of the critical northern development machinery in this discourse? Secondly, we've seen from the previous discussion that there is a great deal of critical thinking and knowledge in every field in which we are discussing. Knowledge is already there and it is provided from different angles. And the most interesting aspects of the criticisms do not stem from the huge pool of so-called expert knowledge, but above all from what, con what one could call uh, experienced knowledge 
What I mean is um, the richness of knowledge from activists and grassroots movements. That was very clear and um, impressive during our discussion that um, many insights or most important insights come from there. Um, so another open point for our discussion when um, asking the very fundamental questions of how to put down the whole things is what knowledge is most missing in the discussion about decolonizing aid? Where are really the gaps and the lags? What kind of knowledge is most missing? Does the global north still play a role here? Which one? Which is the role of the north? And what role does science play? And again, can science from the north make any, con any productive contribution here besides? finally learning to listen. And then the last point, um, when um, looking back to the last three sessions is um, probably um, what are currently, so my assumption, you heard it from this kind of question. The assumption is that productive knowledge is coming from the South. Most important inputs are coming from the South. Most important inputs are coming from movements and activists. Um, having this in mind, then how to sum up what are currently the most important incentives? What are the most important points um, for learning about um, decolonizing development coming from South-South discourses? And now we're coming finally um, to our guest. Um, I assume we've we found really the best person um, um, we could um, find in this transnational or international scene of discussion, who is Professor Sabelo Lobo Gacceni. Um, he is currently chair of Epistemologies of the Global South with emphasis on Africa at the University of Bayreuth here in Germany. So a really kind of transnational endeavor. In addition, um, he holds, I didn't count it, um, how many um, um, chairs um, at almost all universities in um, South Africa being as um, Professor Extraordinarius or being at as um, Honorary Professor at UNISA, at U of S, at the University of Kwasulu Natal. Um, so he is really a central figure in the whole discourse on um, decolonizing, not only development, but also the whole thinking about development and the question of um, epistemologies um, from and in the global south. I also didn't count um, the number of books he has published, but it was early as 2008, 2010 and 12, um, 13, 14, again and again, books appeared. Um, and they all talk about um, the context of um, postcoloniality, decolonization, and um, the um, question of um, epistemologies of the South and um, um, views to development. So look, we are very, very happy, really, you made it possible um, to be with us today. Um, and um, the floor is yours for um, a lecture and um, preaching then the way into discussion. And thank you, thank you, Uta. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you everyone for inviting me. I'm actually recovering from a bit of a nagging cold, but I hope I will be able to, to pull through. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not coming from the, the practice of uh, our development aid. I'm coming from uh, the university. Uh, and uh, so my thinking really is located uh, within uh, the institutions of knowledge production. Um, here at the University of Bayreuth, uh, what links me with the development is that I teach two courses here on uh, knowledge in development and another one, development in postcolonial Africa. 
So <clears throat> I will draw from that experience to reflect on the issues of decolonizing aid, planetary solidarity beyond aid. I must say that uh, uh, in its current conception, uh, and uh, I don't think aid can be easily be a force of transformation, planetary solidarity, and a means to reach the horizon of a future of a good life for everyone and everything. And uh, I'm saying this because from my uh, where I'm standing, the aid is still located within modern global power matrices. Uh, it is still caught up in shifting geopolitics geopolitics and its imperial designs. It is still linked with the development industry, which so far from my own assessment has not successfully resolved the socio-economic uh, power inequalities. And let me maybe put it even more simpler. Let me posit that in what we're talking about as aid, I think we must be clear that there is a rhetoric of aid and a, a reality of aid. And what I mean by that is that the rhetoric is humanitarian, but the reality is colonial and capitalist. And I think I will actually say it is within this context that the question of decolonizing aid becomes relevant. But again, we must be precise in our use of the revolutionary concept of decolonization with regard to aid, because this concept also has come to be abused. It is also becoming an industry in its own, in its own way, whereby everyone is decolonizing something. Uh, so I think uh, as we meet today, we want to be precise exactly what we mean to decolonize aid for purposes of advancement of global transformation, planetary solidarity, and the enhancement of good life for everyone and everything. And they, I, will, I won't take long. I will actually reflect on two issues and then reflect on the questions. Then I will open up for, for discussion. Uh, my two entry points will be, I think the major challenge which we face, both in the academy and also in the practice of development is the question of the structures which were bequeathed on the world by the colonizers model of the world. I think we, we need to think carefully about those structures because even with good intentions, as long as the structures are serving something else rather than the good intentions, we generally don't realize the results which we want. That's one. Two, uh, I think the other important aspect which recurs is the question of knowledge, the question of rethinking thinking on development and the humanitarian aid. Uh, what knowledges really inform our thinking about development? What knowledges inform our, our thinking about a humanitarian aid? And how 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 useful are those knowledges in enabling us really to change from the colonizers model of the world to what we want? And uh, I think it is also within this context that the concept, uh, which uh, uh, the concept of smashing the windows becomes very important because I think we will need to be very specific which windows do we need to smash in order to repurpose aid for the benefit of solidarity and for the benefit of good life of, 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 of many others. I think it was the South African economist, Sempi Teleplange, who posited that we cannot understand the challenges of our time without understanding the ways in which 
5,000 years of Western empire building, often with the complicity of the elites of the Western world, have shaped our world into a deeply unequal and a gratuitously unjust place that it is today. And I'm using this uh, argument to enter into the, the issues which we need to smash, the structures that were bequeathed by colonialism and uh, the colonizers model of the world, which continue to inhibit our good intentions to, 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 to repurpose aid. And uh, I think uh, we need to be very specific here uh, because um, uh, I think we need not to claim easy victories. If, if, if I can invoke Kaplar, uh, Amilcar Kaplar's idea about uh, this being careful not to claim easy victories. I think one thing for certain, there are th some things which are very resilient uh, ever since the dawn of the, the modern world. And one of them is the, is the problem of racism and the white gaze of development. Um, I think we have not really moved beyond that, both theoretically and practically. And then the second one, which I think we need also to, to think about if we are to smash the windows, is the issue of the after, after, after lives of enslavement and the regimes of labor, subjection and exploitation, which continue to today. And thirdly, we need, of course, some people will argue that we are now 60 or so years since decolonization, if they are thinking from Africa. But I think it is important that we don't think about colonialism as an event, but we think about colonialism as a power structure, which has got afterlives and they, which actually uh, shape the global hierarchies of power. And I think we need to, to focus on that as well. Uh, and they put our heads together. And if there is any solidarity, we need to have solidarities around these issues. And then the fourth issue is, of course, the perennial, we need to maintain a perennial critique on capitalism because capitalism is the one which continues to reproduce combined and an uneven development. And it is even provoking today the anger of nature, uh, which results in what we call environmental or ecological crises. So it's important that we also think about that. And then the sixth issue which we need to think about uh, and which needs to be smashed is also the patriarchy and the, the heteronormative sexism, uh, which it has it is bequeathed on the, on the modern world. And then a seventh perhaps is the neoliberal moment in which we are uh, with this restructuring, uh, structural adjustments and the fundamental uh, market fundamentalism. I think that also still frames and still inhibit the possibility of aid being able to, to be a force for transformation. And then finally, we need also to think more carefully about the military industrial complexes and the paradigm of war, which causes all these miseries, which are actually putting strain on the humanitarian aid system uh, and the, the exportation of the conflicts into, into the global South, where the, the imperial powers don't fight within their own home ground. They actually fight in Syria. They fight in in in, uh, in Libya. They fight in uh, in uh, in Iraq and other places. And now they are fighting also in uh, in uh, in in the Ukraine. And I'm taking the Ukraine. I'm taking Eastern Europe as also a South in a, in a, in, a, in of a particular kind. A South, if you look at it in relation to Central and uh, and the Western Europe. So those were the my first remarks, and I, I want to argue that uh, the second issue which we need to to put our heads together is the issue of knowledge, and uh, I want to try and explain why the issue of knowledge is very important for us if we are to repurpose the aid. Uh, the first thing is that. Uh, 
knowledge frames reality. Uh, some will say epistemology frames ontology. So it, it frames it frames reality uh, and, the, and the what type of knowledge from what form of reality becomes very important. And here, when I was thinking about the issue of knowledge, I also tried to distill a few issues, which I think are important for us to actually form solidarity. We need to, in conceptual terms, to rethink the whole idea of development. And I think uh, it has always already been mentioned that uh, it is still entrapped within within what uh, within what uh, the linear thinking of uh, uh, salvation, civilization, progress, modernization, and emancipation. And uh, and uh, I think we need to really decolonize ourselves from this uh, neo enlightenment thinking. Uh, and uh, and in this, in doing this, we will then be able to open up to other conceptions of uh, um, a good life uh, coming from the global south, such as maybe Ubuntu, Pachamama, Bon Vivia, and, and, and others. The second issue, which I think is important from a knowledge point of view, is also to think, to rethink the whole modernist idea of a behind and an outside, uh, that the global south is outside. What is needed is more modernity for 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 people to live better, and they also that the issue is to is to is to catch up because we are behind. That's why we need all this aid. We need all this this uh, this uh, this support, and this has given uh, open the 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 floodgates to. Uh, the continuation of the white menace burden, or what today they call it the white survivorism. And they, it also sustains the Truman version of, 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 of development, uh, uh, which, which is always accompanying the, the global imperial designs. And they, I want to then <clears throat> argue that if we think that way, then we have the problem uh, of uh, producing a people who are an object of development, a subhumans who cannot do things for themselves, who needs to be assisted from somewhere. And that argument, we'll need to think carefully about it because how did, how, how are these people who are unable to, to do things for themselves, how were they produced by the power, the modern power dynamics? <clears throat> and they, I think we need also to in order to do that, we need to think about thinkers from the global south, like Franz Fanon, who said, "If indeed we are decolonized, it means therefore <coughs> we will be reproduced as craftsmen and craftswomen. In other words, people who are able to do things for themselves. So the struggle really is to produce the craftsmen and the craftswomen, not not subjects of aid." Not subjects of or objects of mod, of of of, uh, of of development, and they, again, they thinking also with the thinkers from 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 Africa, we can go back to the ideas of Amilka Capran, who defined development as a return to the source. I'm sorry, decolonization as return to the source, and this fundamentally meant a return to history because imperialism, colonialism. Uh, uh, denied uh, uh, the, the people of the global south, uh, it actually denied that they had histories. So it means uh, 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 <coughs> decolonization, you, you return to history and also you take charge of your mode of production. So it means fundamentally aid, needed to aid this return to history and uh, to also the return to 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 take charge of the mode of production, and if we can also, if I can continue to think also with the another thinker from the global south, Ngukwationgo, who defined decolonization as remembering, and the remembering, not 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 in terms of memory, remembering R E hyphen remembering, which fundamentally means picking the pieces after years of dismemberment. And if aid can actually be 
something which assists us in picking the pieces, then it will actually be uh, capable of, uh, of solving some of the issues. Then the, the third problem, which I think from knowledge point of view, is the problem still of comparative approach to, to development, where, whereby North America, uh, Europe still remain the templates of, uh, of, of, of development. I don't need to, to waste your time on that. I think you all know. And uh, I want also to say that uh, the question of knowledge uh, is becomes very fundamental because in 1979, the Nigerian political scientist Claude Ake published a book, Social Science as Imperialism, how knowledge itself can actually be a hindrance to development of a people in the sense that it actually ends up imposing particular knowledge and ignoring uh, indigenous knowledge systems, which can actually assist people to, to think for themselves. And also the problem which I see as I teach development is the resilience of the classical economic thinking in, in, in development. And the hidden in so much, so many of the blueprints, the plans and everything, you can, you can feel the smell of it in, in most of them. And then, uh, then after these few remarks, I wanted to, to go back to, to the questions posed by Uta. Uh, what are the current most important incentives from the recent South-South discourses for learning about decolonizing development? And, and uh, to me, that question immediately says, um, the most immediate issue is to for us to not to consider the global south as 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 a as a problem to be solved, but perhaps as voices to be heard. And if we do that, we will therefore begin to go back to take seriously some of the ideas which have come from the global south. Remember that it was Franz Fanon who said Europe is made of the third world. And what does that mean? This means a number of things. It means that there will be no industrial revolution without enslavement of Africans, without the endangered labor of Indians and, and the Chinese. It means it also speaks to an even structured global development as a systemic issue which need to be smashed. It also speaks to the idea that the current signs of underdevelopment and the current signs of poverty in the global south are not a natural phenomenon, are not a natural stage of development if, as, as posed by W. W. Rostow. They are actually a product of a system, the workings of the modern system. And we need to really uh, unmask that the decolonization is unmasking what is hidden. We need to unmask the, how this modern world works in such a way that it develops one part and underdevelops the other part. And this takes us back to the 1970s, where there was this demand for a new international economic order. Uh, and that, that demand, which was saying, the major problem is that uh, colonialism created a racially hierarchized world system. And a decolonized world needs to create an egalitarian world system in which there is interdependence of both the global north and the global, the global south for the good of everyone. And I think it is from this thinking that we can then move on to the issues of reparations and restitution. Um, so it is indeed here that we then also think of, uh, think of uh, the responsibility of the global north, the responsibility to really align with the progressive movements in the global south to push for a redistribution of resources which are concentrated in one province of the world at the expense of the other provinces of the world. And this, you can see it in the, the massive movement of people from the, 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 the geographies of poverty and the underdevelopment into those geographies where the, where the wealthy is concentrated. And that is unsustainable. And they will need to really to campaign for, 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 for changes in that. And then uh, the other question was, what knowledge 
is not what knowledge is not missing in the discussion about the aid and what role does science play i think i've already hinted on some of the issues here but let me say this knowledge and the science to live by knowledge and the science for life has to be liberated from knowledge and the science as expertise that is knowledge and the science to control, dominate, and exploit others. I think it, 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 it is important that we, we, when we think about decolonizing knowledge, we think about this issue. A, a knowledge has been also been colonized itself and they re-instrumentalized for, 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 for purposes which are not for life, which are not uh, to live by, but which are for control, for domination, for exploitation. And I think we need to think that very carefully. To what extent can critical independent development organization from the North make a substantial contribution to the discourse of decolonizing aid? Again, here, first of all, I said, I doubt whether there is anything like critical independent development organization from the global North. And I'm saying this because coloniality leaves nothing unsubjected to power. So even what appears as critical independent development organizations that are subjected to power in a particular way. But I think if they think, if they exist, they can contribute by freely allying with such movements as the Black Lives Matter movement, the women movements, the feminist movement, the indigenous people's movement, and the others to demand the destructuring of the global power structures, to demand the decolonization of knowledge and to demand the changing practices of deliver of aid as charity uh, and the shift that to reparations and restitution. Maybe let me stop here. Uh, I hope I've provoked you enough. Thank you. Oh, maybe I continue. Thank you so, so much, Sabelo, for bringing <laughs> us, so to say, back to the point. This was very clear. This was sharp. This was thought provoking um, and um, very much <clears throat> inviting us uh, into discussion, I think. Um, there is already one first question in the chat that appeared while you were talking and perhaps we really start with this point and invite everybody else um, to think and rethink um, what are your questions and um, Denise then will give us instruction um, whether um, people join us into the fishbowl or not. So the first question, I don't know whether you saw it yourself, Sabelo, is about yeah. um, um, putting or considering Ukraine as in a way part of the global South. Why do you frame it like this? And what is your point? Um, the question was, isn't it two oligarchic systems um, fighting each other um, in this war? Or what is the, the Southern part? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I deliberately put it that way and I knew it was going to raise the question. Uh, my 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 take i think is a it takes us to a broader question what do we mean by the global south and the and the, the global south not being a geography per se but being a, a locus of enunciation and the, in the work of decolonizing which we do here we have southern europe for instance you must all know that uh, the advocate of epistemologies of the global south is boaventura de santos who is based at the University of Coimbra, yes. uh, which, which if you don't think about the south of the south within the north and the south in the south, uh, the north in the south, you will then be surprised why is he doing that? But uh, he is thinking from Southern Europe mm -hmm. and uh, again, Southern Europe actually feels being a periphery of Central and, uh, and, and Western Europe. And for, 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 for Eastern Europe, I think there is a lot of work which is emerging from that part, which really defines itself 
as also having experienced various forms of uh, domination by multinational empires from the Habsburg, the Russian, there are, there are so many of the, of, of, the, of the empires which actually dominated that space. And, they, and they, up to today, there is a lot of developing thinking about decolonizing from Eastern Europe, which is very different maybe from decolonizing from, 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 from Africa, decolonizing from Asia, decolonizing from Latin America. So I, I'm, I'm really convinced that Eastern Europe is also, it has its own South. It has its own, its own, own feeling of peripherality. Uh, if if I can put if if I can put it that way, uh, and 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 and, and uh, this war which is taking place, we cannot discuss it uh, fully outside that mm -hmm. framework. As far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that was very much clarifying. Denise, do you want to take over? Uh, yes, sure. We can maybe um, take the first person who raised their hand uh, to the panel. Um, also, we want to encourage everyone else to continue to do so, raise your hands and take advantage of this fishbowl format. The first person to raise their hand, uh, the most courageous one, so to speak, is me. Um, you can now come to the panel and unmute yourself. It will take a couple of seconds. Uh, selamat malam. Saya bisa bicara dalam bahasa Indonesia. Halo. Apakah saya bisa bicara dalam bahasa Indonesia atau harus berbahasa Inggris? Oke, okay, terima kasih, Ibu. Uh, I'm going to speak Indonesian. We were talking about decolonization. And I am, I am part of a movement. I am based in Bali and in Indonesia. And the organization I'm working for is reading the archives about culture and we think about how we can strengthen our cultural roots. Just a second. What I'm trying to say in the context of this very interesting discussion that we're having here today, what I'm trying to say about the context of knowledge. But before we speak about all this, we have to define who can define what the Global South is. Those definitions about the North and the South, where do they come from? Maybe this definition has to change because the context is decolonization. The societies in the South that have to be decolonized, maybe we have to reconsider the definition of North and South and and come up with a new system, with a new um with a new system, with a new concept, a post-colonial concept. Because in our social structures, we have values that are rooted in our culture. And they emerged when the first oligarchy uh, was in power here, that was the Dutch trade organization. 
and their concepts and thinkings are still rooted in our society. And the knowledge from that organization, VUC, and other colonial powers later on has always been included in the next colonial powers. So we have to think about we have to bear all this in mind. So maybe maybe they benefited from the current definition and that leaves the local people out. And I also agree with what you said about Russia and, Ukra and Ukraine. When we look at the current situation, with the Kyoto Protocol, Greta Thunberg, and all of a sudden there was there there is this panic about global warming and other issues. People are worried about uh, whether or not it will be able it will be possible to le to live on planet Earth in the future, and local cultures that had an that had a an adaptive approach that were reactive, like the traditional societies in Indonesia, they were destructed by colonialism. We understand that. But who benefited from that in the context of knowledge? Do we know what that knowledge is? Is is one kilometer does the same in Europe, Indonesia, and everywhere in the world? You know, th there is an agreement about this, but, okay. Okay. but I think that... Keep a little time. Okay, terima kasih. Okay. Can now so, sorry for interrupting you but um, to leave to leave enough time exactly yeah okay so it's your turn Sabila. i didn't even get to the the question maybe is there anybody who can uh, summarize what was saying i could hear that he was also problematizing the issue of uh, the definition of the global south, but I didn't get much of the, and because I don't have the headphones here, so the interpretation does not come to me. Oh, oh, you, but you you have this globe symbol um, in um, um, the um, menu part of the zoo, yeah? The, the interpretation. And and there you can you also can choose the channel um, of okay. um, the language. So okay, yeah. That um, I mean the, the the very basic and central point of the question is, and I hope I got I got you right. Was where does this global south global north um, distinction come from? Um, with all the implications and consequences is is it has? Isn't this um, a kind of very problematic dis, um, construction? Don't we have to go back to this north south divide in principle? And um, if um, I summarize you wrong, please mm. give us one more sentence. I, I didn't notice the name of our contributor. I hope I, this kind of summarizing was in a way appropriate. Okay, okay. Let me let me let me try to 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 respond to that. I think uh, is the person also speaking from Indonesia. Yes. And, uh, and if he's speaking from Indonesia, is very interesting because it was in, in, in Indonesia that in 1955, 
the leaders of, of Africa and Asia, they met at Pandung and they, and they again, when they met at Pandung, they were really trying to uh, posit a rewelding of the world from the global south, a, a rewelding within a context of the Cold War, where there was a, the two blocks, the Eastern Bloc and the, the Western Bloc, and they were trying to push the issue of decolonization, uh, non-alignment, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the, the whole issue of, uh, of uh, the demand for the, for the new economic order. So to say, where does this come from? Fundamentally, it comes from the colonizers model of the world in which the paradigm of difference was, was actually enunciated. Um, it's a, to agree with the, the, the questioner, it's a problematic categorization, but it's a problematic categorization which can also be useful in the sense that when we speak about the global south, we are not speaking basically about uh, geographical divisions per se. We are, we are actually speaking about um, uh, a product of uh, power dynamics. And they were also talking about uh, those uh, uh, locale of enunciation which are rich in, uh, in histories of resistance to imperialism, to colonialism, to enslavement, to heteronormative patriarchy, to racial capitalism. And they, and, they, and, they, and they were also speaking about it in positive terms uh, when we speak about possibilities, uh, the possibilities of other ways of living, which were destituted, and they, now they needed to be re restituted. So we are really, also speaking really here about locales of knowledge is born of struggles. And, they, and, they, I was, and this actually links with that question of saying, what is it that you can draw from the, the global South, which is useful for the decolonization of aid? I think it is important that we have these, these species, these geospatial species in which there was attempt to destitute the knowledges which were there and the modes of living and the ways of living and the, the imaginations of the future. And, the, and, the, and the when we speak about the global South, we're, we're speaking in those terms. And, the, and the, like the person who posed, the, I wish the world was not like that, but the, this is what it is at the moment. As long as there is, I think what, 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 what we're also speaking to was speaking to very complex issues of colonization of being human itself, in which being human was colonized in two ways, the social classification and the racial hierarchization of human uh, population into white, black, uh, brown, uh, yellow, uh, red, etc. And that, that social pyramid is invisible, but it is still standing up to today. And, 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 and then when it comes to global power, we still live in a world which is very hierarchical. At the top, I don't need to explain that you have the United States, the Pentagon and the NATO, and their accumulation of weapons of mass destruction, and they are detecting to the world what is happening. So we need not to be romantic to say, let's wish we can wish these things away, but they exist. So I don't think we gain anything by wishing them away uh, in terms of our own thinking, but we need to be realistic is a reality. The world is like that. And this is why we will still speak about decolonizing. Okay, now, now we have a couple of questions in the chat and we have some raised hands so um and and maybe we have also a second part open from the any question yeah the, the one who, who just talked um yeah. this is this is about um um but but perhaps we can match a little bit do you yeah. have a plan denise or shall i 
Um, no, um, if you have a plan and you want to go with the chat questions first, then the stage is all yours. But if we want to take the hands first, then I'm going to take. Yeah, not not the all time. chat questions, but perhaps at least one or two. There, there is a, a couple of or there are a couple of questions about um, um, the relation between um, knowledge and aid machinery, so to say. The question is if knowledge is so fundamental for the whole decolonizing process um how does it relate or in which relation do we have to think it um, <laughs> to the, the aid machinery and the question the very precise question was when it is about local knowledge why do we need then financial aid question mark and um that um meets in a way a second question that was raised in the chat, what does this mean for the northern part? Um, should um, solidarity then consist of um, really returning to history, learning about history, mm -hmm. um, concentrate on knowledge building and not so much on um, the um, emergency aid system or things like that? Mm -hmm. Uh, is it possible that I take two or three questions? Maybe then we take another one from the chat. <coughs> and there, there is another one from the chat um, saying, um, what do you think about um, um, programs, gender programs, especially women programs um, in um, Afghanistan? What does it mean, this kind of um, normative intervention um, into um, the society? And then the next question. Is um, Development rhetorics, um, they claim to be human, humanitarian while its practice is colonial and capitalistic. That was your point. Um, decolonization rather being a process to change power structures than an event um, that took place. And um, Boris Heinz says, I see all these points and I wonder in the theme of this event today, what are points or moments where decolonization processes in humanitarian aid can begin? Donors, aid organizations, staff project design and development success were all set up in colonial and um, capitalistic manner. But maybe we no. leave you with this and then we go and then we pass over to Denise and to the um, fishbowl. Let me let me respond to this and uh, maybe let me put a caveat that. Uh, I'm using the word response in the true meaning of it. I'm not giving answers to these questions. These are these are difficult questions, uh, and uh, and I don't think if I claim to have answers, we will have solved the we will have changed the world by now. <laughs> uh, I think uh, let me, in order to frame almost the three questions. Uh, I think it takes us back to the fundamental question: uh, What does it mean to decolonize, uh, and uh, and why should we should we do it? Uh, as one person who have been participating in these debates about decolonizing, we are excited and fearful at the same time. We are excited in the sense that the world seems to have been captured by this fever of decolonizing, but we are also fearful that uh, it might actually turn out to be a metaphor, a buzzword, or, or a word which then loses its revolutionary uh, 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 cutting edge. Uh, so so, so, the, so there, is the, the, there is that. Uh, but uh, I think we need also to, 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 to really take seriously the, the archive from which which has been given birth by the decolonizing initiatives. For instance, if we take one example of an archive, the archive which emerges from Latin America, the modernity coloniality archive, 
uh, that one already gives us uh, tools which we can use when we do decolonizing work. So it already it gives us coloniality of knowledge, coloniality of being, coloniality of power, coloniality of gender, coloniality of nature. And they, it is also developing coloniality of spiritualities. So it, it is already giving us those, those tools. And the issue is for us to dig into what does it mean to, 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 speak, to, to, to speak about coloniality of knowledge, which fundamentally talks about the way we have been uh, socially classified and racially categorized and gendered, if, 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 if we can put it that way. And then uh, it is from there that some were then said to be fully human, others subhuman, and some non-human. And, the, and the, the decolonization is to say, all of this is nonsense, is false in the, in the, in the true sense of the word. It is an, a, a construction, an invention of, 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 of imperial designs. And we need to destructure that. Then it also then says, the, the very idea of classifying people socially and racially and then you gender it into subhuman, non-humans, it has implications for knowledge because you then create an impression that they are subhuman people who without history, without culture, without language, without knowledge, uh, who, who are actually waiting to be discovered and uh, who are also the object of civilizing mission, of development, of emancipation and all that. And then it also then explains to us that once we have created this social pyramid, you will need to govern it. And this is where it takes us to coloniality of power, the institutions and the systems and the, and the, and the structures which have been uh, created to govern this which was invented. And it is this which we talk when we talk about when we, I had the question of smashing the windows, it is this which needs to be smashed. If, if, if anything, the good intention of aid is to make any impact, if it is not smashed, it is immediately captured in these structures which reproduce inequalities, which reproduces differences. So, so really th theoretically, this is where I, I wanted us to, 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 to go to uh, in terms of, of thinking about decolonizing uh, from a conceptual point of view. And uh, hoping that the, the, the conceptual tools actually enable us then to apply them practically because I don't work in the 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 aid industry and also in the development industry i can only provide these these ideas and those on the ground they can then see whether they work or not so 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 that's 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 basically what I, what i was trying to do telegraphically here and the, and the, this this obviously has implications it has implications in the sense that uh, you cannot think about aid, decolonizing aid itself. Aid itself might be, might be, might, might, might be actually a means of something. Uh, so what do you need to think about is the aid within which institutions, which structures and uh, which frameworks. So I was concentrating on the frameworks, not the aid itself. Because this is why I'm saying if we change the structures, the institutions and the systems, therefore we are able to repurpose aid. Aid is important. Uh, even where there was no colonialism, people were aiding each other. Uh, I come from a, 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 an African society, the Ndebele society, where those without Kekli, they were loaned to Kekli by others in order to live. And so this issue of, of aiding each other has always been there in human society. But what is problematic is if you link aid with the global imperial designs, then, then you have a problem if, if, if it is like that. And this is why the question of decolonization becomes a, a fundamental. And the, the question of the, the, the gender programs uh, in Afghanistan, while I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not fully sure about what is happening there, but I think from a development point of view, we are trying to shift from the 1990s discourses of women in development, women and the development, the what and the wheat type of thinking, uh, as though they need to be brought into development. The issue is really to get into, to unmask 
what development is all about. Um, and bearing in mind that this is not a rejection of the concept of development itself, is really to say uh, every society had uh, the potential to self to self improve over time. Uh, this problem which we are having now is another geography of the world taking the responsibility to, to, to develop the other part of the world. This is not natural. This is a product of history. And this is why we are bringing the history, the historical background into, 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 into all this. I'm not sure whether it answers the question, but that's the response which I can give. Yeah, it was a, a very, very important clarification, I think. And uh, at this, at the same time, um, um, a kind of demonstration how it works to smash windows. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> um, um, Denise, can you go ahead with um, fishbowl um, contributors? Uh, yes, of course. We have quite a long list. Four or five more hands were uh, raised. And uh, the first person I'd like to um, get to our panel is Miriam. Uh, she will be allowed on the panel and then can unmute herself to speak. Mm, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> mm, thank you so much for the interesting inputs in the discussion, first of all. And I noticed that along the discussion, I was stuck with uh, your last um, argument. And I'm not sure if I uh, paraphrase it correctly, but it stuck in my head as in if um, you're working in or if you're an organization from the minority world working on decolonizing aid, that there remains a dilemma because the power structures or the distribution of power will always be on your side either way. And it made me think of Adorno who said something, I don't know if I translated correctly into English, there is no right life and the wrong one, basically. So that's why I was wondering how would you, uh, first of all, if I understood you correctly, <laughs> and second of all, if you have an idea or an input on how to solve this dilemma, basically. Thank mm. you. Uh, do you want me to respond or to take three more, two more? <coughs> do I respond? Uh, th that is uh, fully up to you. I can uh, get some other people to the panel first. Get get yeah. some other people. There are so I many know. questions. Yeah? Uh, then uh, Trinia Mala um, also wanted to make a comment or ask a question, and they will also be able to in a few seconds. Hey, terima kasih. Yeah, suara saya bisa didengar. Saya akan bicara dalam bahasa Indonesia. I'm okay? going to speak Indonesian. Is that all right? Thank you. I would just like to add one thing. Local knowledge has been pushed to the sidelines from the um, elites. What is happening in aid is what the elites want in our country. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, I'm, I don't want to speak about North and South. But I'm speaking about states that provide aid and the others. And my country, Indonesia, is an archipelago. Mm -hmm. And with the tsunami in Aceh, we experienced a disastrous catastrophe. 
Nah, sekarang kami mulai menangkap gitu bahwa kata-kata tsunami ini terkait And actually we knew about tsunamis. dengan proyek-proyek yang dikembangkan oleh negara asal. All of it, but now we felt that there that there was a context um with the projects from other states. So we did not receive aid for free. It was give and take, so we had to give something. And we realized that the aid that was coming in was not for free. There was a debt to be paid. So the aid that we received from the World Bank from the monetary fund, etc. There were conditions to it, and there were links to and the, the, to the social structures in our country. So, in my region, we were already we already had tsunamis in the past. But if we don't use our term for it, but we call it a tsunami, which is a foreign term from another mm. language it it also means overcoming this this danger from abroad so mm. we don't apply the knowledge that we already have in our country and in our language so we have to cooperate and when it comes to restructuring we also have to be we we have to have solidarity between our regions, so the the aid that is coming in, you know, but we don't just want to to ask for help. We also have to consider what the structures are where mm -hmm. this is happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shall we take another one or two? Is there that one or? Um, there are uh, two more new speakers we haven't heard today, and then uh, Ni also raised the hand again. I can give you the two new ones. Uh, you can answer, and then um, we can hear Ni again if there's still time. Okay. Um, then uh, Francisca would be the next one who can come to the panel and speak with us in a few seconds. It always takes a few seconds to get a new person on the panel. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, okay. Um, just from uh, that, you know, uh, I'm a social worker and I've been doing research, a PhD research about all the adults in Ghana and their li lived experiences and so on. Um, and what I realized, so many of the issues they face are connected to global power dynamics and uh, our capitalistic neoliberalistic system. And um, it is ex extremely complicated to connect all that because for, for, for that you need to uh, deal with, with the um, Ghanaian history, but also with uh, the global history, so to say. And um, how deeper I, <laughs> I get there, yeah, I realize what I learned in school um, in history yeah, it was like single events without um, a global connection. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it's very frustrating to uh, to to do a PhD, yeah, to mm -hmm. understand um, all the systems now. And I think this is a problem that um, that we really have to find ways mm -hmm. how to bring global history um, to uh, to students. Yeah, and um, also in, in Ghana, I realized, yeah, there is no book at the big universities about the history of social work in Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's everywhere. And I think um, we can learn so much from history, especially when you go deeper and deeper. Yeah, for example, the Marshall Plan, and you, you have to go then really deep, yeah, and to read <coughs> that um, um, it's connected to to trade um, and to exploit um, colonies and so on. So it's so deeply rooted in our system, mm -hmm. and I think this is what nobody talks about. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we have to deal in an interdisciplinary way. Yeah, not mm -hmm. only social work, not only economics, 
um, mm -hmm. not uh, only history, it has to be connected. And this is a mm -hmm. big task. And I think yeah. this can't happen in school or mm -hmm. not in our school system right now, because there are so many hierarchies and mm -hmm. Western hegemony or hegemony of Western knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to, <laughs> how to, <laughs> Yeah, yeah I get what, I uh, get what I wanted to say. Thank I you. Get, I get you. Thank you, Francisca. Um, and then the um, last question for this round, and then um, you can answer, is, is by uh, Radwa, who will join us now. Um, I want to go back to um, the question that was asked at the beginning in the chat, um, namely around this whole question of Ukraine and Russia. Um, we also mentioned the question of militarization in uh, your in, in your mm -hmm. um, input, mm -hmm. and I think it's really interesting to also look at what's happening right now in the questions mm -hmm. of hegemonies and militarizations. Mm -hmm. um, because there are voices that are saying that we are witnessing some kind of shifts also, global shifts mm. um, right now. And mm. I'm wondering about two things. So the one thing is how do you, or where, where and how do you position the question of aid there and the notion of aid mm. in those shifting, those shifts, those two, maybe mm. two or more shifts. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is also um, when we see the, um, I mean, they're not really new powers, but mm. in the Germany mm. that are now are being mm. seen as new powers like mm. China mm. or the regional powers mm. like mm. Turkey mm. and Saudi Arabia and so on. Mm. Um, what are the horizons that are being opening that are mm. being opened there? Mm -hmm. um, how can we think further decolonization in these mm. shifts and in these hegemonic uh, constellations? Mm. 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 Yes. No, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for these interesting questions. And uh, let me start with the, the last one. And um, I hope I put my head on the block with the, 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 the claim that uh, Ukraine is in the global south. But let me, let me explain where I come from. I'm actually working on a, on a book project now. And the book project is uh, entitled Rewelding the World from the Global South. Uh, beyond coloniality of internationalism. And the opening part of it is really about, it was provoked by the, the, the outbreak of the, the Russia-Ukraine war in February 2022. Uh, I could not have written it if it was not for that. So I've been also thinking through the, this, 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 this uh, a, a question, a contemporary question of today. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, when uh, Uta was uh, introducing me, he said, I've written so many books. I, I, I don't write books for, for purposes of either promotion or something like that. I write books because of the topicality of the problems which is facing humanity. And uh, when the war started, I could not just sit. I thought I would need to also make my voice heard about. So it's a, it's a book which I'm working on which, which, which starts really with the, the concept of decold war. The first chapter is really decold war, where I go back to the problems of the Cold War, uh, which led me to try to also think about Eastern Europe. And then I move on to think about uh, internationalism. Uh, what exactly is happening to the concept of the international, the global order, and, and, and all that. But uh, why I brought it here, where we're discussing decolonizing aid, is because I see a lot of aid, but aid which is destructive, aid which is in the form of tanks, weapons, which escalate uh, the, 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 the conflicts, and the aid which actually bring in the, 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 the what I call the, the military industrial complex into, into, into all this. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about the military industrial complex in the context that they sell more, they make profits out of death, if, if, I can put it, if I can put it as directly as that. So I was really uh, raising that in that concept. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I also see 
that the war is not really between Russia and the, and the, and the, and the, and the Ukraine. Ukraine has become a theater of war, of a global war uh, in the true sense of, 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 of the word. And I was also raising the issue that the major problem about what you call hegemonies is that they always export war to somewhere else. They don't want war to be fought in their backyard. So they always fight in other, in other spaces. And those spaces where they tend to fight are actually part of what I would call global, global South, whether it's Eastern Europe as, as the South of, of Central, of Western Europe, or Southern Europe, or, or, or you go to the Middle East. So I'm, I'm thinking around, around all those issues. But uh, of course, my limit is that I'm not generally thinking from Eastern Europe. Uh, despite the fact that I'm based here in Germany, I'm still thinking from the continent, from, from, from Africa. This is where I understand issues from. So uh, if, 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 if that book comes out, you will find that it starts really about um, the Ukraine war and the global South responses and the perspectives whereby I tried to what what has been Africa thinking about Asia, uh, Middle East, and 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 all that. And I was prompted, of course, by the the debates we were taking place at the at the United Nations General Assembly, particularly the voting patterns and the, the people absenting themselves and 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 some deciding to be neutral. In, in all this. And this all tells us about the shift also from ideology to transactional relations among powers. And, and, and there, is a, there is a lot of complex issues which I can speak about, but that's where I come from. This is why I posited it that way. Then in the other question, which is also related to this, is an important question which is raised by about the issue of aid and the debt. Aid and the debt. Uh, and I think the the, the 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 colleague raised an important issue when he is talking about these tsunamis which are affecting uh, the areas and the and the the, the, the aid uh, coming as aid but ending up as debt. And the, one of the key uh, problems of the global south is what 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 Nguki what Thiongo has called the debt slaver. Uh, that there is really indeed uh, this this issue of keeping of the global south the really finance still continuing to finance the rich global north through um, a, a repayment of these huge debts. Uh, uh, I was born in Zimbabwe and the, the, this week when I'm talking, uh, the former president of Mozambique was in Zimbabwe trying to assist them to deal with the debt, uh, debt which, which, which is always creating uh, these problems. So this problem of uh, those who are actually in the in the geographies of, of poverty, still at the same time every year, paying for the good life somewhere else. It's, a, it's something which we need to think about. And the way we think about, when we think about solidarities, of course, we're thinking about moving from being practitioners into activists and the, and the, the issues or around which issues can we actually form solidarities and can we articulate our activism? And that's, that's basically, those are the issues which I think uh, uh, and then there is uh, the question about the power structures and the uh, Adorno saying there is no, uh, no right or, or wrong life. Um, in the decolonial uh, uh, school, uh, which, is, which, is, which is not a singular school in the true sense of the word, which is various schools of thought coming together. There is a, an attempt to really think about uh, uh, a problematic uh, world and a world which is better than this one. So the idea that uh, when the during enslavement was a bad thing, uh, colonizing was a bad thing, genocides were bad things, uh, and, and they, from that perspective, there is normativity in the in the thinking that there is really an attempt to say another world is is possible, another world is possible which is better than this one. And the decolonization, even if you think it from Emia Cizé, you think about it from Leopold Zeta Senghor, their idea was that we want a world which is better than the pre-colonial and better than the colonial. So the idea of a, a good, a, a better world is always there in the, in the, in the, in the decolonial thinking. Um, and I know that 
uh, the decolonial thought is always posed vis-a-vis -vis post colonial thinking and the post colonial thinking there are some versions which actually say i know the, the let's not think about perfectibility of the world let's think about the complexity of the world but in decolonial there is really attempt to think about a pluriversal world where other worlds where worlds coexist less conflictually than now so there is there, there, there is that there is that that vision there is that horizon Thank you very much. This was already kind of a um, sum up. Yeah, Andrea is telling me um, um, we do have not more than five minutes left, but a couple of um, raised hands and questions. <laughs> um, so please, if um, Denise is calling you to the panel, then keep it as short as possible so there is um, the um, opportunity left for Sabelle to really give a kind of response yeah yeah perfect there are two people uh, who would uh, like to uh, speak and I think we have the time for them if like Uta said you um, try to keep your question or your comment pretty short the first person is me who we've already heard in the beginning of the discussion um, the second one will be Rosa, but me, you can uh, start as in your as you're on the panel. I seem to be some well, thank you so much. When we talk about decolonialization and talk about its meaning, well, then it starts with a certain country specific perception and awareness. I would like to ask the following question. Well, the money that comes from a specific country, doesn't it come with a certain agenda? And maybe it's linked up to a new form of colonialization. Maybe it's the new kind of colonialization that they bring along. Because so much money has come from the different institutions within the framework of fighting climate change, or money from the World Bank, you name it. And in the end, the countries receiving that money end up piling up debt. Mm. And I believe it is important to continue discussion about that. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to be able to continue it without the donors of money, that we can cooperate on decolonialization colonializing the structure because we need solidarity. Mm. A type of solidarity for a joint effort. Mm. And to, to be able to form your own imagination. Mm. So we are all aware of the fact that this is something we own together. It's shared ownership. It's something we can use together. Mm. But see to it that it is commercialized and it can be linked up to a capitalistic framework. Mm. So thank you so much. And I hope that we can continue the good discussion mm. somewhere else. I would mm. love to get more time to discuss further questions, but I know that time is of the essence today. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. Then I will uh, bring our last raised hand for today to the panel, and that would be Rosa. Yeah, hello. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, my name is Frage, I come from Peru. I come from Peru, which was a colony of Spain back in the days. Now, my question is the following. Much is 
misogynistic approaches, triarchy. This plays a role in colonies. How can we allow a space for women in these colonial structures and give them the space they need, the rights they need? I talk about, I'm talking about rape, femicide, mm -hmm. child labor. This was my question and the interpreter apologizes, but the sound was very poor. I hope I could summarize. No, the I got it. <clears throat> from the chat which is asking whether there is what or any kind of possibility for decolonizing aid within the institutional context to shorten it yeah no thank you so much for those uh, questions um i think uh, for the last one can we decolonize aid within the institutions uh, aid it might be innocent what is not innocent is us who are supposed to distribute it to share it to drive it so fundamentally decolonizing does not mean decolonizing aid itself it means decolonizing ourselves okay. and uh, this really takes a painstaking process of learning to unlearn in order to relearn uh, how to do things differently so uh, if the people who are actually embedded within the institutions which deliver aid have uh, a, a changed consciousness, then aid will mean something else, <laughs> will, will mean, mean something else. So basically, the question of decolonizing is not a question of me pointing to somebody else, it's really to pointing to myself as a modern subject produced by these problematic institutions and the histories. And how do I change my consciousness? And if I change my consciousness, what forms of knowledge am I working with? And what forms of practices do I do I do do I engage in? So 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 we we are, we are at that stage that at the moment a lot of uh, us are rethinking thinking itself and unthinking some of the things which we thought were right before. So 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 there is there, there is a potentiality there in the, in the, in the, in the, in, the, in the direction of of decolonizing. Then there is um, the question about um, uh, money coming with the strings, and I think this is a long, a long, a long, <laughs> a long, a long debate. Uh, as as they say, there is no free lunch. They they normally say that when they when they are speaking about whenever somebody gives you money, you must know that there is something uh, which is which is linked to it. But to broaden it more broadly. Um, in 19, 1943, I think that was 1943 in the course of the Second World War, um, Winston Churchill went to Harvard to address uh, there. And uh, it was there that he spoke about the empires of the future will be the empires of the mind. What did he mean by that? I think we need to really go back to that type. He, he made it clear that the empires of the future will be empires of the mind. In other words, you will need to work with the mind. It won't be possible to continue with the physical empires. The physical empires were delegitimated. They were very weak within the, cold, the, the Second World War. Uh, the US was emerging and it was against the physical empires. So, and he said we needed to, to, to think about the empires of the future as the empires of the mind. And if you then link with Nguk Wathiongo's work, he talks about colonization of the mind. In other words, the empires of the future are empires which actually work with our minds. Uh, they, 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 they invade the mental universe and they make us see the world in a particular way. And it is there that the question of epistemological decolonization becomes very topical. Uh, where, where, where was I? Um, oh, I was here. <clears throat> And the and the question of uh, of imagining other 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 alternatives, of course, at a global scale, you will find that 
re-westernization, the attempt which, which the US is doing at the moment to try to mobilize what it calls the free world behind it, which we call re-westernizing, uh, is clashing, of course, with the de-westernization, if we use the words of, 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 mm -hmm. of Walter, Walter Mignolo, de-westernizing with China, with the emerging uh, 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 countries of the global south, and, uh, and uh, coalescing within what we call BRICS and APSA. And the BRICS really challenging the, the westernization by even bringing uh, into, into, into fruition a BRICS bank, uh, for instance. So there is, there is that, that de-westernization, which is not yet decolonization, because it still works with the frameworks of, of capitalism at the center. So, so there, there are a lot of initiatives which are taking place in the attempt to, to de-westernize, but they are not yet escalated to really to, de to, to decolonize. Uh, and then there was a, there was a, another, another question which was very, very important. Oh, Francisca, I didn't answer Francisca's question, I think, where he was talking about Ghana and the complex global power dynamics. And I wanted to refer Francisca to a, a recent book by Slivia Timale. Slivia Timale is from Uganda. And she wrote this book, um, Decolonization and Afrofeminism. And in that book, he poses a very interesting question, which actually speaks to what we were saying. She actually says, who will connect the dots of racism, enslavement, colonialism, racial capitalism, heteropatriarchal sexism, so that our children can understand. And the decolonial project is really one which tries to connect all these dots. We are criticized most of the times of always going back to history and then coming into, but the intention is really to connect the dots so that we really have a deeper understanding of the complexity of the problems which we are facing at the moment. Problems which manifest now, but their roots are not now. Their roots are actually deep in history, deep as deep as going to the time of the unfolding of modernity itself. So, so there is, there is that, that ability. If, if anything doesn't come out clearly, it is my limit, not the limit of the school, or the decolonial school. The decolonial school, is very expansive. It goes really deep into, into the modernity coloniality uh, uh, moment uh, during its, uh, its, uh, its unfolding in the 15th century up to, up to this. So there is an attempt really to connect the dots so that we understand the problems of today. Because one of the major problems, if you don't historicize, the problem is that you end up taking symptoms of problems as causes of the problems. Thank you so much. I will end with that. Yeah, thank you. That was kind of the really perfect closing remark. I'd say that the, the, the title of um, the book was asked after the author is Silvia Tamale, mm. and um, she's a Ghanaian um, university professor in Uganda. Ugandan. Uh, Ugandan. Yeah, so, so sorry. Yeah. Um, the, and the title of the book was um, a decolonization and Afrofeminism. I think somebody has put it already on the. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, but um, th this was kind of um, closing remark at its best and summary at the same time. You led us to very, very principal points and aspects of our discussion. And at the same time, um, we got into very concrete and precise details. Mm -hmm. Thank you to all thank you to all of you in the audience for this very lively debate and exchange um thank you for your patience that we could not respond to each and every aspect that was raised but we did our best to um yeah don't know produce kind of inclusivity mm -hmm. again thanks to everybody some windows i'd say um are really not only open but broken right now. Um, our final round of this um, decolonizing eight question mark series um, <laughs> will happen or on um, 19th of March. Um, that is within three weeks. And then the question is demolishing the house question mark. <laughs> so um, yeah, 
hope to see you or to have you all then again with us, um, wishing you a very nice and um, um, perhaps lazy Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. Um, if you are in Indonesia, then we wish you good night, sleep well. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. It was great. I enjoyed engaging with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.